on traumatic brain injury is a critical care pharmacist virtual ICU at Baker Health System in St. Petersburg, Florida, USA. She is also a critical care pharmacist at Tampa General Hospital where she had her residency training in critical care pharmacy. A board-certified critical care pharmacist by the Board of Pharmacy Specialties. She had her residence in training in pharmacy at Detroit Medical Center in Michigan, well, while her Doctor of Pharmacy was earned at Wingate University School of Pharmacy, North Carolina. She is involved in various projects in her institution such as IC Liberation ABCDF Bundle Rounding Tool and Targeted Temperature Management and many more. So today to discuss the traumatic brain injury, ladies and gentlemen, our third speaker, Dr. Whitney Gibson. Hi everybody, my name is Whitney Gibson. I'm a critical care pharmacist and today we will be discussing traumatic brain injury, specifically the management of intracranial pressure. I have received a speaker's fee for the preparation of this presentation, but have no other conflicts to disclose. Our objectives today are to review the primary and secondary injury which occur during traumatic brain injury, to identify the pathophysiology associated with elevated intracranial pressure, to list modalities of intracranial pressure monitoring and their target thresholds, and to assess the pharmacological and non-pharmacological management of elevated intracranial pressure. Starting with definitions, there isn't one solid definition for traumatic brain injury. However, the general consensus is that there's a change in neurologic function secondary to head injury with a resultant decreased level of consciousness, amnesia, skull fracture, neurologic abnormality, or an intracranial lesion. Prevalence was last reported in 2014 by the CDC. 2.87 million traumatic brain injury related emergency department visits contributing to 56,800 deaths. However, we did see between 2006 and 2014 mortality decrease by 6%, likely due to better monitoring practices and practices in controlling intracranial pressure. There are two types of injury discussed with traumatic brain injury, the primary injury and the secondary injury. The primary injury indicates the actual head trauma. The secondary injury describes the downstream injury caused by that initial head trauma. And this is where we see the energy dependent cellular necrosis that causes the membrane cell lysis, edema inflammation, and energy independent apoptosis that causes the cell shrinkage and cell membrane dissolution. In front of you is a very simplified overview of secondary injury mechanisms. The inflammation, cell lysis, and apoptosis, cellular edema, and necrosis involve several pathways, most of which either begin with or result with ischemia of the brain tissue. Our focus today will be on the treatment of elevated intracranial pressure and severe TBI cases, so we'll focus our attention to this portion. Traumatic brain injury severity is classified based on the initial GCS or Glasgow Coma Scale score when the patient presents for medical treatment. Severe TBI indicates the baseline GCS would have been 3 to 8, which as you can imagine, based on the GCS criteria, means the patient is either completely non-responsive or very minimally responsive. Complications from the secondary injuries of TBI can lead to cerebral edema, elevated intracranial pressure, decreased central perfusion pressure, hyponatremia, hypotension, and hypoxia. All of these complications play a role in how we monitor these patients as well as a role in the treatments that we consider. Cerebral perfusion pressure, mean arterial pressure, and intracranial pressure are all related. 
Think of your MAP or mean arterial pressure as the pressure exerted against the vessel wall, which helps keep the vessel open, mostly related to our blood pressure. And this is indicated in the graphic as the blue arrow. The intracranial pressure is the opposite force represented by the pink or red arrow. This is the pressure that the brain contents exert against the blood vessel. The cerebral perfusion pressure is the difference between your MAP and your ICP. In the setting of an elevated ICP, the MAP would need to be increased in order to maintain a cerebral perfusion pressure high enough to keep the brain perfused with blood and oxygen. This also assumes that all of our autoregulatory mechanisms are still in place and working, and we'll touch on that later. As with most emergent situations, we need to focus on good critical care in our ABCs, our airway, breathing, and circulation. Most patients with severe TBI will need to be intubated in order to protect their airway, as well as to provide adequate oxygenation. And as we briefly touched on, we focus on our circulation, maintaining normotension and avoiding hypotension. Initial imaging is typically obtained in order to stage and assess the severity of the cerebral injury including detection of any blood, identification of any skull fractures, and identifying if there is a mass effect. So now we'll start digging into the management of intracranial pressure, which is the focus of the remainder of this presentation. The best place to start, in my opinion, is to discuss the Monroe-Kelly Doctrine. This hypothesis shows that we have a finite area in which our cerebral contents can live. We have the brain, the blood, and the CSF that all live inside of the skull. And as we know, our skull does not expand and shrink when the volume of these contents are changed. An increase in any one of these components rapidly can lead to an increase of intracranial pressure. As brain volume increases, CSF is displaced into the spinal fecal sac and blood is compressed from the cerebral veins with little increase in ICP. Over time, these compensatory mechanisms are exceeded and the ICP starts to increase exponentially. Intracranial pressure becomes elevated in these patients for several reasons. Our autoregulatory processes often become impaired in the setting of acute TBI, and when autoregulation is intact, a decrease in our cerebral perfusion pressure results in vasodilation to increase our mean arterial pressure and our cerebral blood flow. When that autoregulation is impaired, the decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure does not trigger a vasodilatory response that will increase our MAP and cerebral blood flow. This, of course, results in ischemia and worsening that secondary injury. Keep in mind this isn't an all or nothing and each patient will be different with varying degrees of impairment. So we really have to look at our patient and their response to different therapies. Additionally, hydrocephalus, hematoma, and cerebral edema in general will increase our ICP by the elevation of volume inside the skull. The guidelines discussed throughout the rest of the presentation are from the Brain Trauma Foundation. Their most recent complete guideline was published in 2017 with a notice that they're moving towards what's called a living guideline, meaning any updates necessary due to new findings in literature or a need to shift practice will be released as needed instead of publishing an entire guideline every few years. Their most recent update was published in 2020 regarding recommendations for decompressive craniotomy, which we'll touch on later. Important to consider as we continue are the recommendation levels. Level one indicates the literature evidence was considered to be of very high quality. Anything with level 2A indicates the supporting data was considered to be of moderate quality. And anything with 2B or level three indicates the evidence used to make the recommendation was considered to be of low quality. So should we monitor intracranial pressure when our patients present with TBI? 
As you'll find with most TBI topics, the answer is not cut and dry and still remains unclear. The Brain Trauma Foundation TBI guidelines do make recommendations and recommend using information from ICP monitoring to reduce mortality. The literature evaluating patient populations who should have ICP monitoring versus who shouldn't are sparse and the quality isn't strong. There's also varying levels of availability between hospital systems, so we have to take that into consideration as well. The Neurocritical Care Society does give some recommendations for situations where you might consider ICP monitoring, mostly encompassing those with abnormal imaging, signs of diffuse injury, or severely impaired neuro exams. There are monitoring methods, and we won't go into details today, but this is provided for completeness. There are invasive monitors, which you may recognize at like an external ventricular drain or EVD, as well as bolts. The difference between these two, mainly being the ability for drainage and re-zeroing of the monitor. Several non-invasive devices are also available. However, their validity and accuracy are not consistent with invasive methods. However, if invasive methods are not available to you or are contraindicated in your patient, you can consider the non-invasive devices. The guidelines from 2017 do state, it's not necessarily the type of monitor that you have that affects the outcomes, it's what you do with the data you get from the monitor, which I thought was very wise. There is also consideration for monitoring cerebral oxygenation, which has not been as popularly adopted. Guidelines recommend to consider using a jugular bulb to monitor arteriojugular differences of oxygen. This is a level three recommendation, so the level of evidence is considered low quality and scarce. The two devices available are invasive and they differ in the monitoring that they offer. The jugular bulb oximeter can help identify global ischemia. The disadvantages include that it requires frequent recalibration and there is risk of venous thrombosis and risk of infection. The brain tissue oxygen monitor is easy to insert and detects regional tissue ischemia, not global ischemia. However, the data may be inaccurate if it's placed proximal to a hematoma, which will alter the ability to detect ischemia. A recent management algorithm was released in 2020, which was created by the Seattle International Severe Traumatic Brain Injury Consensus Conference. This today is the most concise algorithm, and so we'll walk through it together. The algorithm divides severe TBI patients based on, by type, based on their brain oxygenation and their ICP levels. Each type is then broken down into a tier of care. Movement to a higher tier reflects increasingly aggressive interventions. And here, treatments in even any given tier are considered equivalent, with the selection of one treatment over the other based on individual patient characteristics and physician discretion. During any given episode being addressed, multiple items from a single tier could be trialed individually or in combination with the goal of a rapid response. In some cases, it might be preferable to skip one or more tiers, like to choose decompressive craniotomy if a patient has a midline shift. No individual agent or combination is critical success with managing TBI. Clinical judgment must always determine your management strategy. So we'll start with tier zero, which applies to all severe TBI patients, regardless of ICP or brain oxygenation monitoring. Regardless of the presence of the monitors, this would also be the treatment for type A or no brain oxygenation or ICP issues. All patients should be admitted to an ICU, intubated, receive serial neurologic exams, have their head of the bed elevated to 30 to 45 degrees, have analgesia and sedation on board to prevent ventilator dyssynchrony and to prevent agitation, maintain normothermia, maintain a cerebral perfusion pressure above 60, 
maintain hemoglobin over seven, avoid hyponatremia, optimize venous return from the head, have continuous blood pressure monitoring, and maintain oxygen saturations above 94%. Some patients may need a central line in tidal CO2 monitoring or EEG monitoring if you suspect that the patient is seizing. Now on to type B, where a patient is considered to have elevated ICP but has adequate brain oxygenation. Don't get overwhelmed by this image. We're going to start with tier one. The cerebral perfusion pressure should be maintained between 60 and 70. There are not a lot of studies comparing CPP targets and the quality of the literature, sample sizes, and the methodology are all variable. The guidelines and the widely accepted consensus is to target a CPP of 60 to 70. There are some questions about which should be considered the minimum. There's evidence to suggest pushing CPP above 70, that that may be harmful in some cases. So typically it's recommended at this stage to avoid any aggressive measures to elevate CPP. The next consideration is to maximize sedation and analgesia. Guidelines only make a targeted recommendation for the use of propofol. They state that propofol is recommended to help with ICP control. However, it doesn't improve mortality. Higher doses and high dose in the study was considered to be greater than 100 mics per kilo in the first 48 hours are associated with higher vasopressor rates and the risk that comes with vasopressor use, more use of neuromuscular blockade, and more hemodynamic instability. When it comes to maximizing analgesia and sedation, the agents used will be patient-specific, as they would with any ICU patient. The hemodynamic effects and pharmacokinetics of each agent must be considered. Several opioids have been studied in the TBI population. Keep in the front of your mind that all trials evaluating sedation and analgesia for ICP control are extremely variable. When reading these studies, we have to dig deep into the baseline care they're receiving. Some studies will include their care algorithms, most do not. In many opioid studies, the patients were also receiving neuromuscular blockers. Some were receiving mannitol, some hypertonic saline. So many different variables can affect their outcomes especially their effects on hemodynamics and ICP control. But that being said, we'll dive into the potential benefits and cautions to consider with opioid use for ICP control. Opioids in general help with ventilator synchrony by depressing the respiratory drive. We also know that when a pain for sedation approach is utilized, agitation and the need for sedation is typically offset. There have been studies comparing effects of bolus dosing versus continuous infusions of different agents and have shown that bolus dosing potentially increases ICP by altering hemodynamics. However, continuous infusions do appear to be safe with mixed efficacy. Fentanyl appears to be the favored agent. Sedatives such as propofol and benzodiazepines help to prevent unnecessary movements like coughing, which increases ICP. Propofol has also been theorized to be neuroprotective due to its effects on cerebral metabolism and vascular tone. Propofol in particular, however, does have a marked effect on hemodynamics, including blood pressure and cardiac output. Pulmonary shunting driven by hypotension has been associated with sedation. However, utilizing continuous infusions and appropriate titration parameters help to minimize hemodynamic compromise. Ketamine historically has been a contraindication for TBI population due to findings early on that it could elevate ICP. Although as our critical care management has improved, including our use of mechanical ventilators and optimizing those settings, literature has not found ICP elevations with ketamine. It's hypothesized that the early studies in the 80s to early 90s used vent settings that maximized spontaneous breaths, which is what drove the ICP elevations potentially and not the ketamine. Now we recognize ketamine is one of the great tools in our tool belt for sedation, analgesia, and for ICP control.
Ketamine also has potential neuroprotective benefits against ischemia, cell death, and neuronal degeneration, as well as inhibition of glutamate toxicity, which has been studied well in the TTM population, has anti-inflammatory properties and favorable hemodynamic profile. Ketamine, watch out for, can also increase tracheal secretions. Next, there's a recommendation for maintaining partial pressure of carbon dioxide at the lower end of normal. Guidelines recommend against prophylactic hyperventilation as a strategy to prevent elevated ICP. Carbon dioxide directly affects cerebral blood volume and thus ICP. Targeting a lower than normal CO2 can cause vasoconstriction and a theoretical decrease in ICP, although aggressive hyperventilation to target levels less than 25 can lead to decreased cerebral blood flow to the point of ischemia, which we definitely want to avoid. Prophylactic hyperventilation in the literature leads to worse outcomes, including arrhythmias, increased myocardial oxygen demand, and cerebral ischemia. Other ventilator strategies to consider are to utilize low PEEP. One study found increased PEEP does not increase ICP, except in patients with severe lung injury. Next, we have hyperosmolar therapy, which we are all most familiar with. The main agents used are mannitol or hypertonic saline. Guidelines no longer support a recommendation for either due to a lack of strong evidence. However, the use of these agents is still widely accepted for ICP control. Both agents help reduce ICP through reduction of blood viscosity, which improves cerebral blood flow and ICP. Choice of agent and concentration should be patient specific with all benefits and risk in mind. Mannitol should be used with caution, especially when patients are hemodynamically unstable as it has a diuretic effect that can further worsen hypotension. Hypertonic saline would be a better choice in a hypotensive patient since especially with the 3% concentration, has volume expansion properties. 23.4% boluses are typically reserved for patients with a severe change in mental status or high suspicion for a new midline shift or new onset edema with symptoms. The debate regarding bolus versus continuous infusion hypertonic saline is old and continues to be debated to this day. We have one head-to-head -head trial that focused on osmolality outcomes, not effect on ICP, unfortunately. However, most evidence and consensus recommendations agree that bolus dosing is ideal as it helps limit exposure to the high amounts of sodium and chloride, as well as unnecessary fluid, and can be run through a peripheral line. Continuous infusions may expose the patients to higher risk of hypernatremia, hyperchloremia, and fluid overload. If your patient does have an EBD in place, another consideration in tier one would be CSF drainage. The debate regarding continuously draining CSF at a low rate versus intermittently is still ongoing. There may be more benefit con to continuous drainage, especially in patients whose baseline GCS is less than six. Of note, the CSF continuous drainage does have more support in the pediatric population. Moving on to tier two, the next recommendation is to allow lower PaCO2 to 32 to 35, which as previously discussed, may help with vasoconstriction and resultant reduction of ICP. If the ICP remains elevated despite tier one therapies being utilized, another pharmacologic option would be the use of neuromuscular blockade. In general, neuromuscular blockade should be avoided, but it can be considered if deep sedation is insufficient to manage vent synchrony or elevations in ICP. 
Again, we have very few, less than a handful of studies evaluating the use of neuromuscular blocking agents for ICP control, and most found no significant effect, although the agents, the dosing, the methodology, of course, is very different between these evaluations. Although when you deep dive into the sedation literature, many patients were on neuromuscular blocker therapy already. One study compares cisatricurium to atricurium and found cisatricurium to have less effect on hemodynamics. Based on what we know about these agents and their kinetics and dynamics, they may be useful to prevent ICP fluctuations during activities like positioning or suctioning and may help reduce oxygen consumption. Some thoughts to consider are that to date, studies have not shown a benefit with one study actually showing that use of neuromuscular blockers having longer time with an ICP over 20. Neuromuscular blockers have also been associated with hemodynamic instability, increased incidence of pneumonia, and longer vent days, as well as ICU, longer ICU length of stay. The next recommendation is to perform a MAP challenge. The MAP challenge will give a better idea regarding if the body's autoregulation mechanisms are still intact. We're not gonna go over this in detail, but just know that since autoregulation is a concern after TBI, it may predict whether a certain therapy may be better to use versus another, this is a way to assess if a patient's autoregulatory mechanisms are intact. If the patient's autoregulatory system is working, you can consider fluid boluses or vasopressors to help increase cerebral perfusion pressure and have a resultant decrease in ICP. Next, we move to tier three. This tier contains what are considered to be options for refractory ICP elevation. All other methods have been tried without success. First, we'll discuss barbiturate use. Guidelines recommend barbiturates as refractory therapy to consider, but recommend against its use as a prophylactic agent. It's also important to assess hemodynamics and make sure the patient is stable on or off of pressors prior to initiating. Barbiturates such as pentobarbital, phenobarbital, and thiopental are helpful with lowering ICP and may have a role when neurosurgical intervention, interventions are not available. The literature to date leans towards thiopental being more effective than phenobarbital, but thiopental is not available in every country. Manufacturers of these agents typically tightly control distribution since historically, prisons have used them for the death penalty and manufacturers don't wanna be associated with that use. These agents notoriously cause hemodynamic instability. Another issue to consider is the half-life of these medications. Many times a patient may not clear the drug depending on the agent and the length of time on the continuous infusion for upwards of a week or two, which complicates the ability to ethically conduct a brain death exam. The next treatment for refractory ICP elevation is decompressive craniectomy. Guidelines recommend that if a decompressive craniectomy is considered, that it should be used as a late treatment, as in after all other methods have been exhausted, versus an early method, because using it as an early treatment resulted in worse outcomes and that a large frontotemporoparietal craniectomy should be used versus a small one. These recommended interventions have shown mortality benefit in this population, and these were actually updated in 2020 after the publication of the Rescue ICP trial, which is a randomized controlled trial which compared decompressive craniectomy versus medical management for refractory ICP within 10 days of admission and found significant differences in ICP reduction and favorable mortality benefit and GOSE outcomes at 12 months post-intervention. Although there are not any official recommendations for when to consider a craniectomy, these indications are generally accepted. 
as always, the specific patient case and risk versus benefit should always be considered. Therapeutic hypothermia has also been considered for management of refractory elevated ICP. Guidelines recommend against early and short-term prophylactic hypothermia. The trials have a lot of variety of protocols used, different targeted temperatures, the different durations of therapy, the population that was enrolled. Overall, there's a lack of high quality data, but there is some theoretical benefit. Some potential benefits of hypothermia piggyback off of benefits for why we do targeted temperature management, such as preserving neurological function and preventing further ischemia. Hypothermia may also be protective against seizure. These benefits are all theoretical and have not been proven, and the risks of hypothermia are many, including bleeding, infection risk, and coagulopathy. Also, shivering may lead to worse neurologic outcomes. Some small studies have found potential mortality or neurologic function outcomes to be favorable. However, these cohorts were not powered to detect mortality difference. Some studies are also noted that the outcome would be better in a cohort with better GCS scores at baseline. In one study, the hypothermia group also had surgical hematoma evacuation, so it's unclear which intervention provided benefit. In severe refractory cases, hyperventilation can be considered. However, as we discussed, should be used as a last line option and for a very short period of time. The next group is type C, where ICP is not elevated at baseline, but the issue is with cerebral oxygenation. Most of these therapies focus on techniques to improve cerebral perfusion pressure and oxygenation status. One notable difference would be to increase the FiO2 or amount of oxygen delivered by the mechanical ventilator up to 60% to help increase the amount of oxygen delivered to the brain. Here we may also consider increasing the partial pressure of oxygen as high as 150. Another difference we see here is to raise the CPP above 70, which may be an, op an option. Again, just trying to deliver as much, much oxygen as possible. One of the differences in tier three is to consider normobaric hyperoxia. So increasing the PaO2 increases the amount of arterial oxygen content and thus the brain would technically receive more oxygenated blood. However, studies have shown that this may aggravate secondary injury after TBI, so it should only be used in very specific cases for a short period of time. This technique has also not shown to improve survival or neurologic outcomes. Another consideration targeted to increase delivery of oxygen to the brain in refractory cases is to transfuse packed red blood cells for a hemoglobin of less than seven. The thought here being that oxygen needs hemoglobin as its transportation vehicle, and at a hemoglobin of seven, there are very few vehicles to transport oxygen to the brain. Type D patients will have elevated ICP, low cerebral oxygenation as well. We've already discussed most of these therapies included in this algorithm in more detail. Tier one would focus mainly on ICP control, maintaining adequate cerebral perfusion pressure and maximizing analgesia and sedation, draining CSF when the option is available, using hyperosmolar agents, maintaining adequate partial pressure of carbon dioxide to maximize vasodilation, and increasing FiO2 to deliver more oxygen to the brain. Tier two recommendations consider cover increasing PO2 to deliver more oxygen, further maximizing analgesia and sedation, the use of neuromuscular blocker agents to control ICP, 
completing a MAP challenge to assess for presence or absence of autoregulation, and CPP control with fluid boluses or vasopressors. Tier 3 includes our barbiturate comas and decompressive craniectomy for ICP control, as well as considerations for hyperoxia and red blood cell transfusion to increase the delivery of oxygen to the brain. And that concludes our brief overview of traumatic brain injury and specifically management of elevated intracranial pressure. Thank you so much for your attention.